So I'm going to speak about a, a, a number of issues which I think resonate with the two previous speakers, although um, the, reson the resonance with Nick's, uh, Nick's argument probably will not be so obvious as I go into my talk, so I'm going to tell you straight out that my earliest inspiration uh, for the t th this line of inquiry actually comes from Raymond Williams. That was not, uh, will not be obvious, I don't think, but just think his challenge to base superstructure metaphors. Um, as far as Nick goes, I think you'll hear a stronger argument for culture, and we can discuss why I think that um, while compatible, we ultimately have to hear, we ultimately have to turn to cultural accounts of the economy. Um, so, we're focusing on contemporary capitalism. I'm going to show why I think that extended and robust cultural analysis uh, is essential for understanding the power of contemporary capitalism. I'll begin by noting a curious omission in our general theoretical understanding of what makes capitalist action make sense. Returning to sort of some shared, shared theoretical foundations, which might seem uh, rather basic, but that is to compensate for the fact that some of the, the later stuff I'll be discussing will probably be unfamiliar. Next, I'll talk about uh, where sociology has got so far to patch the omission um, and review, uh, reviewing different ways of understanding contemporary economic culture in terms of cultural production and contingent action. But I'll suggest that all of this work now needs more focus beyond the many close interpretations we have of culture in economic action. We need a new inventory at least, and perhaps more, of those broad discourses which help make sense of fundamentalist, fundamental capitalist assumptions, like about economic interests in business, as I've investigated, but also as we're beginning to see on such topics as industry beliefs, prices and futures. The studies are out there, but we need a new synthesis. And after looking at, uh, after looking at embedded economic culture in a lot of particular mid-range settings for a long time, we need to pull back and assess what we've learnt that connects to macro-level political economy. I'll finish up with a few points about why I think this is important. So first, what makes capitalist action make sense? My own interest in economic culture began with this apparently naive question. What makes self-interested action in the pursuit of profit make sense? How do firms and people in business understand their interests? What cultural categories and vocabularies of motive make capitalist understandings routinely plausible for capitalists? That is, why do they even bother? You can see this comes from a very distant sort of anthropological um, sense of what's going on in capitalism. Capitalist action itself is entirely naturalised, not only in public narratives and economic models, but also in social theory. In public narratives and economic models, it's common sense, right? We all know this, that the archetypal capitalist actor will do everything possible to pursue narrow interests in shameless ways at the expense of others. They'll try to shape state policy to protect profits and promote cold and unjust ideologies. Economic life in contemporary society requires strategizing about the next uh, statement of earnings or market share or submitting to the demands of those who must do so. Intermittent public scandals and destructive systemic failures only reinforce the point. Even where welfare states and corporatist regimes and legal regulation or paternalistic virtue soften the harshness of capitalism, those are only band-aids. That's my problem. The crucial assumption that market action is necessarily oriented by a universal norm of self-interested exchange was more or less taken for granted. For sociologists, of course, Smith and Marx make this our common sense, although they obviously differ in their valuations. They set the deep terms of debate. Max Weber did, as we've heard, famously highlight the cultural peculiarity of capitalist norms of exchange, how they initially came to make sense and how they might have become widely established. But Weber doesn't account for the persistence of capitalism's weird norms of exchange. They become the famous inescapable 
iron cage of modern life. In fact, I argue, it's only Durkheim, and not really a theorist of capitalism at all, who begins to address how competitive, self-interested exchange can possibly be sustained. Whereas Weber asked how the self-interested pursuit of market exchange could possibly emerge as a dominant economic force, Durkheim begins to raise the neglected question about how it could be sustained. For him, a complex division of labour, like in capitalism, generates issues of social solidarity, right? And no society, he argues, can function simply on the basis of contracts between self-interested <coughs> actors. So Durkheim's question about how solidarity is even possible in complex societies becomes the question of how capitalist action can be routinely plausible. He rejects the assumption that the norm of systematic self-interested pursuit of profitable exchange is enough. I think the radical implications of his theory of solidarity for our understanding economic life haven't been fully exploited. Durkheim's project suggests that assuming nothing but self-interested, self-interest is naive and short-sighted, and we need to understand culture in capitalist economic action. So contemporary sociology responds to this demand to some degree. We now have a lot more empirical studies helping to get beyond facile assumptions about what capitalist economic action means. Here I'm going to talk first about work on what cultural sociologists would think of as cultural production. I think we now understand the production of, cultural, of, of uh, economic culture quite well. Although they might not use this theoretical vocabulary, um, most, economic, most sociologists interested in economic life pursue some variant of the cultural production perspective, which, as Peterson taught us, and as you know, addresses how the symbolic elements of culture are shaped by the systems within, within which they're created, uh, distributed, evaluated, etc. At the broadest level, cross-national studies of economic governance show how supposedly rational, self-interested action is shaped by institutional context. Economic actions contingently bound by institution-level norms, rules, conventions, habits and values. Governance theorists develop the argument that capitalism isn't a generic, globally uniform institution, but varies according to the ways it's socially embedded. Different forms of governance include corporate, an emphasis on corporate hierarchy or networks or associations, as well as the pure market. For instance, O'Brien contrasts governance in steel industries in terms of how they influence cultural understandings of legitimate, legitimate partners to exchange, um, in terms of independent firms or networks and so on, and, and cultural understandings of norms of exchange, arms length market or extended informal reciprocity, etc. I've listed a, a number of other related examples there. Is efficiency of railways the same thing everywhere? No, Dobbins says not. Is economics institu institutionalised the same everywhere? No, Marianne Foucard shows not. Um, is foreign direct investment the same everywhere? Nina Bandel shows certainly not. Another variant of cultural production arguments is neo-institutionalism. Like governance theory, um, these people look at how in fields of economic action are created, sustained and changed. Unlike governance theory, they're much more, uh, they're much more attentive to mid-range inter-organisational relations than to broader comparative historical typologies. For neo-institutionalists, economic actions shaped by institutional fields which take on independent status but has a powerful normative effect on subsequent action. I'll let you read uh, more of that. These neo-institutionalist views of economic action are essentially cultural because institutions are rules and shared meanings that define social relations. I'm quoting here um, who, uh, who occupies what position in those relations and guide interaction by giving actors cognitive frames or sets of meanings to interpret the behaviour of others. The many examples of research showing how institutional settings uh, influence economic action is uh, lists and lists of these uh, include, for instance, how the, uh, a new for-profit for recycling industry is generated, um, how higher education publishing uh, is affected by cultural logics which focus the attention of decision makers on 
in organisations on issues and solutions that are consistent with the prevailing uh, institutional logic. And my work on um, business associations, I argue that we need to understand them first and foremost as cultural producers for industries, producers of categories, networks, fields, collective identities, status orders and camaraderie. It's impossible to account for the thousands of trade associations that exist simply as political interest groups.